So the month of April, we decided, well, I guess maybe I decided, to, to make the theme for this month, April Fools. And I had somebody in for after first service say to me, you know, when you first announced that theme, I was th thinking, where in the, how in the world are we going to go a whole month with that theme? But so far, so good. Two Sundays, so good. So I think we're going we're gonna to make it through the whole Sunday, so, or the whole month. So what do I mean by, you know, having a theme of April Fools? Well, if we look at... Something very exciting is happening out there. Or right, anyway, sorry, I got distracted. If we look at the way the word fool is used in our lexicon, in our language, all the different phrases and, and, and idiosyncratic terms that we use uh, that have fool in it, I started thinking about that and looking at them. And, and as I looked at some of them, I thought, you know, there could be a really cool spiritual meaning behind that if we look at it a certain way. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to take some of these phrases that are common that have the word fool in them, concepts that have the idea of fool in them, and then take a twist on them that will support us in spiritual growth. So that is what we're doing this entire month. And in addition to that, I just thought it would be fun to have a, you know, a little foolishness also during the month. So here is our nod to foolishness this morning. And it is going to be, I'm going to tell you about two April Fool's pranks that were played if of course you want to hear about them. Okay, thank you, good, just wanted to check. Just had to check. All right, so the first one occurred uh, on a, uh, the morning of April 1st, so it was April Fool's Day, 1976, during an interview on BBC Radio. So this is a radio interview with a renowned astronomer, Patrick Moore. And this very um, s um, serious astronomer tells on BBC Radio that on that day, at precisely 9.47 a.m., there was going to be an astronomical phenomenon that had never happened before and would never happen again. And this phenomenon was that the planet Pluto, they still thought it was a planet back then, would pass behind Jupiter, temporarily causing a gravitational alignment that would reduce the Earth's own gravity. And he said that if at that very moment, if you're in your home, if you would jump up at that very moment, you will feel like you're floating. You cannot believe the hundreds of calls that the radio received after that happened of people telling that they felt the sensation. And in fact, one woman called to report that she and her 11 friends had actually risen from their chairs and floated around the room. The power of suggestion, right? There's an entire sermon in that, I believe, but we will save that one to another day. <laughs> the other one I want to tell you happened earlier than that. It was in 1957, and this was on television. There was a three-minute news segment announcing that a bumper spaghetti crop had been harvested in Switzerland. <laughs> the report said that this bumper crop was caused for two reasons. Number one, because of the unusually warm or uh, mild winter. And number two, because the, of the virtual disappearance of the spaghetti weevil. There was even video footage of a family picking spaghetti strands of pasta off a tree. Now, if you don't believe me, you can go online and look this up. I watched the three-minute video. I thought about playing it here, but I thought, we don't need three minutes of that. We don't need that. Um, it's out. You can watch the video of this news report. When it was over, the video is pretty funny, actually, but when it is over, hundreds of people phoned in to the TV station wanting to know how they could grow their own spaghetti treat. <laughs> And to this query, the station replied, place a sprig of spaghetti in a tin of tomato sauce and hope for the best. <laughs> All right, enough foolishness. Let's go on to what we're really here to talk about today. Not that. <laughs> Today's theme is fool's gold. What is fool's gold? Fool's gold is a mineral it's actually iron pyrite, which looks so much like gold in, in the raw that many, many a uh, miner in the, in the day would find this, would land upon this, and think that they had struck gold. And were very disappointed when they you know, dug it out and took it to the assayer's office, only to find out that it wasn't 
it wasn't gold, it was iron pyrite, so fool's gold. Today, our work is to not be fooled by fool's gold, but rather to pan for real, genuine, authentic gold in our lives. So what exactly does that mean? It means to focus on what is really, really important, what really matters. And as I was prayerfully discovering what to talk about today, you notice that little throwback to last week, right? Uh Uh-huh, you got that, right? Our decisions are not to be made, they're to be what? Thank you. As I was discovering what to talk about today in this, something kept coming to me, a, a, a quote that I remembered well enough to know the gist of it. It, kept, it came in my head. And it came in once, and I said, no, 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 that's not where I want to go today. No, 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 no. And then I went about my business of prayerfully, <laughs> isn't this funny? We, we open ourselves to discover, and then when it comes to us, we go, no, 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 that's not it. And that's exactly what I did. No, 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 that's not it. And then it came to me again. No, 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 that's not it. And then it came to me a third time. I'm like, duh, hello. Third time's the charm. And as I said in first service, that's certainly for true, at least for me in marriages. I don't know about the rest of my life, but certainly third time has been the charm for me in marriages. That's for sure. So maybe third time would be the charm for me to get that, oh, Maybe my discovery has something to do with this passage that that keeps coming to me. Maybe I just ought to practice what I preach, which is to listen to that intuitive voice, knowing that is the nudge of the divine in us, leading us in the direction that will be of support and service to us, lead us in the direction that we want to go. So I finally got out of my own way and decided to look up the quote. It is a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, And it's his, I think, rather famous quote on success. Several of you are shaking your heads, I see. So you know this quote, or at least you know of it. This is how it goes. To laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and to endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, this is to have succeeded. Isn't that beautiful and powerful? And I think really gets to the heart of a life well lived. Well, let me just have a little caveat over here to say that, of course, this doesn't say anything about material manifestation and, you know, having financial abundance and all of those things that, that we can get very focused on. And, and there's nothing wrong at all with having material good. In, and I believe that material good is in the, the, the good that material good does for us is that is, it is in service of these other things. So that's why it's important, so that we can have the time and the space and the ability financially to uh, do all of these things that, that uh, this quote speaks about. So nothing wrong with that, but really what really matters, I think, are the things that are listed in this, this quote. So let me tell you something fascinating about the quote that I learned as I looked it up to be reminded exactly of what it was. And you know, there are lots of different places on the, on the web. Thank heavens for Google and for the, the web. It's made ministers' jobs so much easier. You know, it's just, let me just look that up. So I looked it up and you know, lots of different places that, that speak of this. One of the, the second place I look, because I like to just check to make sure, you know, it's consistent in what it says. There's a little asterisk asterisk at the bottom of this quote that says, while this quote has been attributed to Ralph Waldo Emerson, there, it does not appear in any of his writings. And I thought, well, isn't that curious? Let me dig a little further. I went to a website called the Emerson Society, which looks like a pretty bona fide website about Ralph Waldo Emerson and all of his work. And we certainly consider Ralph Waldo Emerson a father of new thought, and he was extremely in- influential on our founder of religious science, Dr. Ernest Holmes. So I go to this uh, um, uh, Emerson Society website and find a page that says, this quote, he absolutely did not write. (laughs) 
<laughs> who wrote it is questionable, and there was a long conversation about how it may have come about, and it, it actually appeared in a Dear Abby article, maybe for the first time, and she attributed not to Emerson, but to somebody else, and then someone wrote in and said, no, my mother wrote that, and it's very convoluted as to who actually said that, but it wasn't Emerson, despite the fact that this shows up uh, in, uh, in a lot of ways on postcards and on posters and on, you know, Facebook, cute little Facebook things that have nice graphic images. Everywhere you'll find this quote attributed to him, but I'm here to tell you, no April Fool's joke, I don't think, given my research, he actually said this. So what? It's still really good. <laughs> it's still really good. And it reminded me, though, of the other pretty famous passage in our New Thought Circles that was also not written by the person it was attributed to, and you may be aware of it. It's the Our Deepest Fear passage. Are you, do you know that one? Yes, if you don't, I want to share it with you. This was attributed for years and years and years to Nelson Mandela. It would have been really cool if he had said this. Uh, in his inaugural speech when he became president of South Africa in, 1990, in 1994, it is said that he said these words, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who, are, who am I to be brilliant, talented, gorgeous, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us, and it's not just in some of us, it is in every one of us. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. And as we are liberated from our fears, our presence automatically liberates others. Oh, isn't that good? That has been attributed to Mandela by speakers, by ministers, by posters, on greeting cards, on Facebook pa passages, even framed on a wall in a movie. <laughs> in a movie, the Aquila and the Bee. Did anybody ever see that? Oh, it's a great, it's a very inspiring movie, Aquila and the Bee. Uh, it's about a young girl in a, doing a spelling bee contest, contest, and she works with a spelling coach. And in the coach's office, that quote is framed on the wall, and it says at the bottom, Nelson Mandela. <laughs> Not true. He never said it. Who said it? Who wrote it? Does anybody know? Marianne, good job, you guys are hip, you're up on things. Yes, Marianne Williamson wrote those words in A Return to Love. And she, <laughs> she said, I, I was reading, looking into this uh, on, on the web yesterday, she said, I'm very flattered that people think he said that, but he didn't, I did. <laughs> right, right, right. So now that we have that all cleared up, and we've cleared up the who wrote, well, we don't know who wrote, but we know who didn't write, the, um, the, other def the definition of success, I want to speak about it again. It truly is what's important. It's the heart of life. It's the gold, not the fool's gold, but the real gold in our life. So let's look at it again and why I would say that. To, love off, to laugh often and much. That is exactly what Darius' first song was talking about. You know, happy in the skin I'm in. I, I feel good about who I am, and therefore I can bring the fullness of who I am to life and experience that life in joy. That, to me, is a really important thing. One of the reasons that the third time is the charm for this, this marriage to this man for 25 years, I think it's going to stick, actually. I really think it's going to stick, is because of his most exquisite sense of humor, which you all get to see every single Sunday, but I live with it every day. I mean, he's, this is who he is. He's like this all the time. He makes me laugh all the time because he's happy in the skin he's in. <laughs> so to live, to laugh often and much, hugely important in this life, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children. I think those are interesting that those are together. To win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children. For me, that says that, we, that, that when we're real and authentic about who we are and what we believe and we're not afraid to stand for who we are and what we believe, that 
people of intelligence see that and respect that, and kids see it. We can't fool children. We can actually fool adults maybe a little bit with putting on a facade, but we can't fool kids. So when we're genuine and real and fully coming from who we are, kids will see that and absolutely lo love, love that in us and be drawn to us. To earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends. That's a, a little bit of a hard one, perhaps. But for me, what this one says is that when we are living really in integrity and in honesty, about uh, it's a little bit the same as the one I just said, but slightly different. But when we're living in the truth of who we are, then even those who disagree with us will appreciate us. When I first became a minister, um, I, a friend of mine was actually the Secretary of State at that time. Her name was, is Betsy Bayless, and Betsy is a friend, was a friend of mine. I haven't talked to her in years, but when I first became a minister, she was Secretary of State at that time, and we had lunch. And I'm just like picking her brain, I'm gonna, you know, this is new to me, leadership like this is new to me, I'm scared, and any advice. And she said to me, and I'll never forget it, she said, Michelle, I just want to tell you that I have to make, she said make, I'll say discover, decisions all the time. I have to make decisions all the time. And usually 50% of the people will agree with that decision and 50% will be vehemently opposed to that decision. But she said, what I have learned is that, that if I am honest and real and, and clear about my decision and I stick with that decision versus waffling because I'm talking to you, I'll say one thing and because I'm talking to you, I'll say something else. If, because I don't do that, even the people who disagree with me respect me. And I really thought that was amazing wisdom. And I think that's what this is talking about. That when you live that way, you will be appreciated by honest, even, even by people who disagree with you. And when you live like that, even when you have someone who is supposedly a friend and maybe you find out isn't so much, you're strong in yourself. And so you can absolutely face that and deal with that in a powerful way. To appreciate beauty. Ah, isn't that an important piece of gold in our lives? To appreciate the beauty of life, the beauty of God any, everywhere and anywhere. That's such a powerful anchor for our lives. To see and find the best in others. In my mind, that's to see God in others. And what could matter more than that? To leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition. I love those examples because they're so different. To me, they're just a, they're, they're a sampling and a representation of live from your purpose. Live from your place of genius. Live from your spiritual gifts. What are yours? Maybe it's, maybe it's raising a child. Maybe it's raising uh, vegetables. Maybe it's creating a social change. What is your calling in life? To me, that's what that says. And that's an important thing to do in life. That's success in life. And the final one, to know even one life has breathed, breathed easier because you have lived, to me, this speaks to sacred service and to really living from that God space within us, that place of givingness that we are born into and out of, that we, when we make a difference in this world, we are living from sacred service, or we love to use the, the Sanskrit word seva. And as I think about every single statement in that f poem, if you will, quote, written by somebody, um, as I think about every single one of those, it occurred to me that there is one quality one golden quality <laughs> that must be present in us in order for us to live like that. And that quality is the quality that I read about in our reading at the beginning of this service this morning. That quality is love. Every single one of those occurs to laugh much, to win the respect and appreciation, to, to, to be able to appreciate beauty. All of those things come because we're living from love. The master teacher Jesus in Matthew uh, 20, 22, verses 37 through 40, he's being in this scene, he's being um, interrogated, if you will, by the Pharisees. And they're trying to trip him up and get him to say something that's, that's wrong. And they ask him, what is the greatest of all commandments? Of course, referring back to the Ten Commandments. They say, what is the greatest of all commandments? And he responds in this way. And we're going to call them this morning uh, bricks 
of love. These are the foundational bricks of love on which we build a life. He said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might and with all your mind. That's pretty inclusive, isn't it? You will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might and with all your mind. That we're going to call gold brick number one. That's the foundation upon which we will walk a successful life. And the second is like to it, Jesus said. Love your neighbor. I'm going to actually call that gold brick three. As yourself, he said. And that, in my mind, is gold brick two. Love God, number one, first and foremost. Love God, recognize that that God, the infinite giver of life, the infinite essence of love is in, as, and through you, and that it is important that you, we, I have a relationship with it. That's what I think that means. Love God and that have a sacred, holy experience with God, however that, whatever that looks like for you. That's why we here teach spiritual practices. That's why we here gather in community like this to have an experience of God every single Sunday and during the week. Whatever works for you, have a relationship, deepen it, create it wherever you are on that spectrum with God. First thing, first brick, if you will, of gold in the foundation of living this successful life. Number two, love yourself. Going back to the Marianne Williamson quote, you were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within you. And as you recognize and know that, then boy, what's not to love? <laughs> if the glory of God is within you and you came here to live that, what's not to love about that? There is everything to love about that. And then the third one, the third brick of gold is to love your neighbor. In other words, love the world because... Again, as Marianne Williamson said, the glory of God is in them as well, right? So to be able to do and be, as I've already said, the, the, those things that are in that list of successes, uh, we have to have these three bricks of gold solidly in place. So I want to give you a little story about that. There was once upon a time a very rich man, very rich, and he had just, that was his life, his, his money, and all of his wealth that he had accumulated. That's really all that mattered to him. To him, that was success. And uh, he was nearing the end of his life, and he knew that. And he was very unhappy that he wasn't going to be able to take his money and his, all of his wealth with him. He was very, very unhappy about that. And so he prayed. He decided to pray that he would be able to take his money with him when he died. Well, his prayers got to heaven, and the angels heard him, and one day an angel decided, you know, he's not going to give up until we come down and talk to him. So an angel appeared to him one night and said, listen, we've heard your prayers. We've heard your pleas. You just need to know you can't bring it with you. I'm sorry. It doesn't work that way. And the man, he was a very, he was a very astute businessman, so he was a good arguer. He argued so much and made such good, um, ex made such good arguments, compelling arguments for him to be able to take his good with him. He convinced the angel to go back and just ask God if maybe God would make one exception for him to be able to take his wealth up to heaven with him. So the angel did that went to God, came back a couple of nights later and says, I, I, I just in so shocked that this has happened, but God has said for you, yes, you can bring one suitcase full of whatever you want. <laughs> the man was ecstatic. He immediately packed a suitcase full of gold bricks, pure gold bricks. That was what he wanted to take with him. <clears throat> so now he has a suitcase packed, of packed full of gold bricks. Pretty soon it is his time. He makes his transition. He shows up at the pearly gates with his bag in hand. And St. Peter had not gotten the word. It's, I'm really glad to know it's in heaven also, that communication thing. It doesn't just happen in churches where you forget to tell, right? The left arm forgets to tell the right arm what it's doing. So Peter had not gotten the word that this guy had special dispensation to bring his one suitcase in. So Peter, but the man says to Peter, no, 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 I've, God said I could do this. Go check, go check. So off Peter went to check with God, comes back and says, okay, you're right, my bad, you're right, you are allowed to bring this, but what God said is that I have to inspect it before it comes into heaven. 
The man says, I don't care. Sure, open it up. So uh, he opens it up. And with that, St. Peter says, oh my gosh, why did you bring paving bricks? We've got plenty of those. <laughs> bada-ding, bada-ding, boom. I'm really, I just have to say this. I'm really glad that First Service reacted much more enthusiastically about that. <laughs> because if they hadn't, I probably wouldn't have told it again. And... Um, you might have been glad of that, but they really laughed, so you, got, you guys got it. The point is that the gold pay... I don't know if I'll tell it Wednesday night. Maybe I... No, yeah, just no, don't tell it Wednesday night. Okay. Gold paving bricks <laughs> of our lives. Love of God. Love for yourself. Love for your neighbor. This is how we succeed. Emma Curtis Hopkins, who is considered the mother of new thought wrote in her book, Scientific Christian Mental Practice, love is the good we are seeking. Love is the highest name of God. Love is the fulfilling of the law. At the height of our spiritual teachings, we find God covering us with love. We find ourselves loving all things and all people. That is so beautiful. And occasionally, we get things a little out of whack. I have up here a demonstration that you've probably been sitting there wondering, what in the heck is all that about? Well, now you're going to find out. And this, by the way, is not a magic trick. Sorry, not a magic trick, just a demonstration. So each of these things up here represents something. First of all, this glass, which has just about filled with water, represents you, all right? This glass is you. And the water that is in here is uh, the love of the divine that fills you. The love of God that you come into this world with. This is you fully filled up with the love of God. All right? This symbolizes the world. This symbolizes your neighbors, all right? In our love thyself, uh, thy neighbors as thyself. This symbolizes your neighbors. When we are filled to overflowing with the love of God, we then can, with the love of God and with the love of ourselves, for ourselves, we then have love to overflow and fill the world. So this symbolizes the infinite love of God. All right, here it is. And I wish this was a magic trick because this would never empty, but it isn't, so this will empty, but this is, we're just doing this as a symbol. So what happens is when you fill yourself with self-love and the love of God, love of God first, you then have an overflowing so that you can pour over into the world and support and love the world. However, what we do sometimes, just tell me if you see this ever in yourself. We pour out, we give. We pour out, we give. We pour out, we give. We pour out, we spill. We, <laughs> we start to get empty. We start to get empty and we don't refill. Instead, we pour out, we give. We pour out. We give, oh my gosh, we're just about completely empty, but we still pour out and give, and then we got nothing left. Anybody know anybody who's ever done that? Righto? Mm-hmm. I like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, right, right. Now, it doesn't mean that infinite love and fulfillment aren't available, because they are. It's right here. It is absolutely right here. And so at any moment, at any time, you can refill and refill and refill. And as you refill, then you have enough to pour over and support the world. <laughs> the front row just got <laughs> baptized here. They did. We're doing a baptismal this morning. So... <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So the question that I offer to you this morning is this. What do you do to refill? How do you refill? 
with the love of God first, first. And then with that love of God comes a love of self. So do you have a regular ongoing communion with the beloved God? Do you have that? I can't tell you what yours should look like because only you can know. But what I will tell you is that if you want to be successful in this world as the way our quote suggests, you must refill yourself with the love of and for the divine through whatever spiritual practice communion you engage in. You must nurture and engage in self-care and self-love in order for you to live that life that is defined as a success. When you, with, from this overflowing picture of God's love, when you do that, then you will be able to laugh often and much. Then you will be able to win the respect of intelligent people and the appreciation of children. You will also earn the, uh, or the affection of children, that's even better. You will also earn, learn and earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayals of false friends. You will appreciate even more beauty. You will find the best in others. You will leave this world a little bit better, whether it's by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, and you truly will know that one life, at least one life, has breathed easier because you have lived. So again, I ask the question, the gold bricks in your life, are you really making sure the first two are solidly in place? Love of God, feeling, filling yourself with that, communing with the divine, and yes, love for self. I want to end with a final statement, wisdom on this idea from Unity co-founder Charles Fillmore in his book, Talks on Truth. He wrote, the love of God must be felt in the heart. It cannot be described. But the more we talk about it, the stronger it grows in our consciousness. And if we persist in thinking loving thoughts and speaking loving words, we are sure to bring into our experience the feeling of that great love that is beyond description. The love, the very love of God. And when we do that, that is when we will strike real gold. Not fool's gold, but real gold. Let's anchor that idea in prayer. Actually, in a little bit of an experience, a mental experience. I love mental experiences. And as I was doing this in first service, I, I got such a, for me anyway, powerful image that I want to just use this image in, in this service and this image of the love of God for us through us and oftentimes when I when I imagine the love of God and what it feels like I go to a warm fuzzy soft blanket just enveloping me I have lots of those warm, fuzzy, soft blankets. About every Christmas, Lonnie gets me something like that because I'm always running cold. So I have lots of warm, fuzzy blankets. But whenever I think about and envision the love of God surrounding me and enfolding me, I think of a warm, fuzzy blanket. This morning, I thought of that as well, but it had an added dimension. It was a blanket made out of golden threads. So I invite you right now to place around you a warm, soft blanket made out of golden threads representing the love of God enfolding you. And as you do that, just feel into what it feels like to be there, nestled, so very safe, secure, every need met in this moment. What a delicious feeling that is. And then you have the recognition and not only the mental awareness, but the heartfelt awareness that as this blanket of golden threads enfold you, you're also filled with it. It's on the inside, too. Because you are the manifestation of the glory of God. So this golden blanket is also you. 
feel into that. How empowering that is. How on purpose you feel. A deep love and respect for who you are. And then I want, to, want you to envision yourself opening your arms, holding on to the edges of that blanket, and open your arms up to envelop the world in this blanket of golden thread. And you might want to start, before we go across the world, we might want to start with that family member you're a little ticked off with right now, or the coworker who annoyed you on Friday. Hmm the driver who cut you off on the way to church. You might want to envelop them first, but then we take it out to the rest of the world and just cover the world in this blanket of golden thread. Knowing that this is the love of the divine and it is this love as Ernest Holmes said, that is the grandest healing and drawing power on earth. So in this moment, we know that this blanket of love that is covering us and filling us and then extended out to the entire world is healing any spot in us or in anyone that needs to be healed, actually where wholeness needs to be revealed. That is happening right now. And that as we are also encircled and filled with this blanket of golden love, that we are attracting to us that which brings joy, that which is fulfilling, that which gives us the ability to enjoy this experience called life. Hmm. That which enables us to succeed. So I am grateful for this. I call this good so very good. And in celebration, we simply let this image now in completely come into us and know that it is who and what we are. And in us is the love of God, the love of self, and the love of neighbors. And that is truly golden. Thank you, God. And so it is. Amen.